Out to center. This is Kranks. It's way back. It is gone! Welcome to the Couch GM Podcast. Today I have on Gary Hill Jr., who is an executive producer, engineer, broadcaster, and much more for the Seattle Mariners. If you're a regular listening to Mariners Radio, then you've heard Gary calling play-by-plays, including James Paxton's no-hitter back in 2018 in Toronto. Today, we talked through Gary's story from when he first got into sports all the way up until present in which he fulfilled a lifelong dream of being a broadcaster for the Seattle Mariners. And now here's a word from our sponsor. Black Label Supplements is a proud sponsor of the Couch GM. Fuel your victories with Black Label Supplements, the ultimate choice for athletes. Elevate your performance with their full line of third-party tested clean supplements. Check them out at blacklabelsupplements.com and use code COUCHGM or use the link below for a 15% discount. Grind, hustle, win, repeat. Also make sure to check out the lifestyle brand of America and baseballism. You can visit baseballism.com. They have a ton of cool baseball apparel and merchandise, including this Griffey line for you Mariners fans. Make sure to use code COUCHGM for 15% off. And as always, if you're thinking of buying, selling, or refinancing a residential property, make sure to reach out to myself, the Couch GM, Connor Webb. You can also visit lenderconnorwebb.com to hit a home run with your mortgage financing needs. And with that, let's get into the podcast. Welcome back to the Couch GM Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Gary Hill Jr., who is a broadcaster, producer, engineer, kind of a jack of all trades with the Seattle Mariners. So first off, Gary, really appreciate you joining me today. Yeah, thanks, Connor. Thanks for having me. I look forward to it. Yeah, I I do a lot of different things. None of them very well, but a lot of different (laughs) things. So They've looked well done from my uh, point of view, so we'll take it. Um, Yeah, I wanted to get into a bit of your story to start off and then get into this offseason. Um, some sights and sounds from spring training eventually. So if you want to start off by walking us through who you are, where you came from, where you grew up, how you found that love for baseball. Oh, so I grew up in Tacoma, not too far from the Mariners, obviously. And baseball was always a big part of my life. I, I've i loved it since I was a little kid. I played as much as possible. I went to a ton of Tacoma Tigers games at the time and then eventually became the Rainiers. Went to a ton of those games. My dad took me to Mariners games in the kingdom a lot growing up, but it was something that I just loved. I fell in love with baseball on the radio too. And it was Dave Niehaus that ignited it for me. Just listening to him. I remember as a kid with this old clock radio, just listening to games as I fell asleep as a kid. So for me, it it all got intertwined and baseball cards was kind of that too. And it was just, it's what I loved the most as a kid. And I remember I used to, uh, and for Dave, it, it ignited like it became clear to me. I'm I'm not going to be a professional baseball player. It became pretty <laughs> obvious. Uh, but I wanted to be the Mariners broadcaster when I was a little kid. And I remember I would play these dice games with uh, Mariners and Cardinals and facing off. And like I rolled double six and that'd be a home run. And I would broadcast these fake games. And I just had <laughs> reams of these notebooks of you know, home runs and box scores and all this stuff from these fake games being played. So uh, that was it for me. I just, I, you know, played home run derby with the kids and we weren't playing real games with, with my friends and we weren't playing uh, real baseball games. And it was just uh, summers full of baseball childhood of baseball. And that was it. The passion was always there. And if you asked little kid me, what do you want to be when you grow up? It was, I want to be a Mariners broadcaster. That was it. That's amazing. Yeah. And I saw that quote to where, you know, this has kind of been what you've been wanting to do your entire life. So to be able to get to that point, is pretty cool. So you grew up, you know, with the love of baseball, listening to Dave Niehaus and the Mariners, what were the next steps? And were you pursuing that, you know, everything that you were doing was like, I'm going to, that's what I'm going to be doing. And then what did that look like? So that's a great question because as I mentioned, little kid me was all in it. It's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a Mariners broadcaster. When I graduated high school though, it became pretty clear to me as I looked around, like at that time, Dave and Rick had been it. Those were the only Mariners broadcasters. And you know, I didn't realize it at the time, but growing up, it was a pretty special time because you had Dave and Rick on one side You had Kevin Calabro, who I think is the greatest basketball announcer of all time, calling Sonics games. 
You had Bob Rondo and Bob Robertson and Steve Rabel, Pete Gross before him. I wasn't aware because I had not traveled around enough at the time and hadn't listened to people all over the country. I didn't realize how lucky we all were because th those were all great broadcasters. And as I looked around, like all these people had had the same jobs forever. And it occurred to me, like, what are the odds that I'm going to get there? I mean, as far as I know, Dave and Rick are going to do in my mind at that point, they're going to do it forever. <laughs> so after high school, I'm like, I'm going to have to do something more practical. And so I went to college and I was studying psychology and I was planning on being a therapist or whatever. And it was a moment I'll never forget. I was going to school on the East Coast just outside of Boston. And it was one of those snowy, awful <laughs> Massachusetts nights. And it just, it just hit me like a lightning strike. Like, I'm not pursuing this because it's not practical. My, my dream, the thing I've always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really stupid. Like <laughs> I should give it a shot. And so I transferred, uh, I decided there, I was going to transfer. I uh, played out the semester and I transferred to Washington state. And the first thing I did on campus was get together with their broadcast group. And it was great because they allowed us to broadcast every single game. It was on the campus station. No one listened, but it didn't matter because we were calling the baseball games and the football games and basketball mm -hmm. and volleyball and everything else. And that's what gave me the running start. And then uh, Pullman high school hired me to do the football and basketball games, my first paying job, okay. which was great. And that kind of started the, the climb up the ladder. Yeah. Good cougs, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so, so you, uh, you got those. So that was your first experience in color commentating was at Pullman with WSU mm -hmm. and then Pullman high school. Mm -hmm. And, um, so you, you graduated from WSU. Did you already have a foot in the door at the next step or was it, you know, just kind of finding your way and eventually you got into the Seattle sports. Did that yeah. come soon after college? You know, it's funny how it ended up happening. So I applied for a bunch of minor league jobs out of college and I got an interview with one and they offered me the job. And I was like, this is amazing. This is great. <laughs> and uh, they go, can you start this weekend? I'm like, well, you know, I'm, I'm still a month and a half away from graduation, but you know, I'll graduate, I'll show up. And they're like, no, we need you to start right away. Wow. <laughs> I'm like, just quit college you, before you graduate. I'm almost, yeah. I'm almost <laughs> done. Like yeah. at this point I I'm on my second degree. So I'm trying to finish both at, at one time. And I'm like, and I'm done with college at this point. Like, I, I just want, I want it to be over. It was fun. It was great, but I'm finished. And I'm a month and a half away. And they're like, no, nah, it's either start now or you're not going to take the job. And I'm like, oh, this is the worst. What so, city would that have been? Uh, I don't want to say. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just because I don't think it paints them in a great light. But yeah. uh, so I decided to finish college. I, I felt like it was the right call to make so i moved back home uh to nothing at that point i didn't know what i was going to do and i got a job so uh i got a job at a place called pioneer sports which no longer exists but they gave me an opportunity to do play by play what came with it was sales and what we would do is we would sell and it was kind of smaller tier sports it was minor leagues small college whatnot so i was calling all over the country on sales calls, like calling different businesses straight out of the yellow pages saying, Hey, do you want to buy advertising for the Wilmington blue rocks or the Huntsville stars or, you know, all these different places. And I hated it and was terrible at it, but some play by play came with it. So I, some go. university of Washington baseball, I was doing the evergreen state college, you know, so I was just doing whatever I could find at the time. And uh, fortunately, after the, the sales part, uh, I was no longer doing that. They didn't let me continue to do the play by play part. And and that's that's was a big pivot point for me. And the other big really turning point in my career was I was doing the Evergreen State College. Right. I'm doing their basketball games. And David Locke, who was moving into the Sonics play by play role because they had split the broadcast. Collabora was going TV, David Locke was going radio. So he was hiring for the Seattle Storm play by play position. And 
he wasn't hiring me. He hired Alan Horton, who's the Minnesota Timberwolves play-by-play guy. He's great. But he thought of enough of me just to bring me in and talk to me, which I thought was pretty amazing. Like, how many guys would do that, knowing that I'm not getting the job, but he was just interested in me. And I remember this. And I, the statute of limitations, I think, is over. And since the Sonics <laughs> don't exist, I don't think anyone can get in trouble for this. Yeah. But he's like, you know, it's too bad that you're not in college anymore because I was just out of college and you could be an intern for us and work on our broadcast. So what I did is I got uh, on an online course to a community college (laughs) for web design, (laughs) which got me an internship on the Sonics broadcast and it lasted a month. And then they put me on payroll. And by the next year I was hosting pre post game for the Seattle supersonics, which is pretty wild, which kind of (laughs) opened the door to, Mariners pre post and and kind of snowballed from there. But David, I owe a ton to David Locke because just uh, giving me a chance when I was just nobody at all, which I always appreciate. And thinking outside the box a little bit with that move. <laughs> yeah, it really. Yeah, and I were I learned a little about web design, which is great. But it was it was the thing that got me in. Like it was it was the difference maker. They didn't have the payroll to put. They didn't have the money to put me on at the at that point, and so. I was doing a ton of work for free, but ended up being well worth it. It was it was a game changer for me. So you're doing, doing pre and post for the Supersonics. What was the date range for that? And then, you know, what was the next step after that? I was the last voice on Sonics Radio. Wow. I, I think yeah. my last words were, we'll see you next year. <laughs> 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 next year has not happened. Uh, amazing. So it was truly heartbreaking because I was – the, the two years with the Sonics were the last two years they existed. And I was pre post the final season and I was in good, po- I felt like I was in a really good position because at that time in the NBA, most of the time was when they hired a play by play guy. And that, that was, that's always been my goal. I love play by play. And so that was always the end game. And a lot of the play by play broadcasters were hired from the pre post position. So I was like, sweet. I was doing Seattle U basketball at the same time, too. So I was still doing play by play. And I'm like, this is great. You know, do this for a little bit and, you know, get into the play by play. And this is amazing. And then the Sonics left, which was a double kick because that was the team that I had rooted for all my life as a kid. You know, those Kent Payton days, I will never forget. Those were amazing and the team i work for and my career like in just blink of an eye it felt like it was all gone and i didn't know what i was going to do at that point i was still doing some college stuff and whatnot and then randomly i got asked to fill in a weekend of pre-post for the mariners just in a 2010 i think in may and it's funny i will never forget it because the first one I had prepped like it was game seven of the world series. It was just this random game at the end of May. And I was ready for this thing. And our radio booth is kind of two tiered. There's a section up front where the broadcasters sit and kind of a section up top. And that's where I was sitting to do pre post. And as I looked down, Dave Niehaus was there. I mean, my, my childhood hero sitting right in front of me and there's Rick Riz and there's Kevin Kremen. I mean, those are the three, my whole life is, right in front of me right (laughs) i'm ready for this thing i'm not nervous at all i feel great matt harden who's back in the studio in my ear says okay 10 seconds music's playing i'm ready to go and then i see dave niehaus put his headset on and it dawned on me in that second oh no (laughs) dave niehaus is gonna listen to everything i'm about to say and i had a moment of just pure panic i was terrified but I do the first segment. I get through it. It was it was fine. It wasn't great. But Dave turns around, looks at me. Way to go, kid! <laughs> I was like, this, is, this is the greatest moment of my life. And from there, uh, it just became a thing of the Mariners and the radio station. I was kind of working for both. Just kept asking me, "Hey, can you do this? Can you fill in here? Can you do this?" And yes, 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 yes. I said yes to everything. And yeah. that's kind of how my role now is I've carved out something I think pretty unique in the game where I'm doing a lot of different stuff, uh, which is great because I like having a variety of stuff. So it's worked out pretty well. 
Yeah, I just have to tell a story real quick of, you know, my first experience being up there as press. And, you know, I'm just going up there to take it all in, I guess. And, you know, I go to the bathroom, I'm walking back to my seat, and I walk by Jerry Depoto the first time that I'm up there. I'm like, oh my gosh. And then I see, you know, Rick Riz and um, Dave Sims and all these guys. And, you know, I didn't, exp I could not see myself here six months, a year ago. And now it's like I'm walking by these guys. It's ridiculous. So that's really cool to hear that story on Nate Knee House. And then, yeah, walk me through. So you keep saying yes to all of your different opportunities. You start with doing the, the pre and post. What's the next step? And I'm kind of curious also with the, the advancements in technology throughout the years. Mm. You know, at what point do you start? I know the, the Mariners podcast, you know, all these different things. And what does it look like when you first start to, to current day? Yeah, so uh, parts of this I haven't talked about is as I'm doing all these games and Mariners and Sonics and whatnot, I'm also a uh, full-time work off to the side too. So it's like I am grinding pretty hard. Yeah. I have a full-time job doing this other stuff too. There were I remember with the Sonics, there were full years where I didn't have a day off between both my day job and my work schedule. And, and then the days I would take off were – to travel to broadcast games. I was fortunate. The places I worked were, were great working with me to allow me to do that. So I'm grinding away at that. And I started the Mariners pod at some point along the line. And it's funny because now it's the Mariners podcast. It was really more independent me at the time. And it kind of got moved into the thing. Uh, the technology is interesting because a lot of my, I, I say all this because my other work was involved in it so I've always yeah. been interested in technology and mm -hmm. fascinated by it and uh, interested in how we can connect what we do to fans because mm -hmm. that's what it's all about. That's what we're here for. And I love the radio part of it. And I always think that radio will have a home, especially with baseball. I think fans will always appreciate it and love it. But I think obviously there's a million different ways we can connect to fans and there's different ways we can connect radio to fans. And we've seen that evolve as we go. Uh, I think I'm fortunate. I've, I've just been really open-minded about changes and willing to do things differently and strive and make changes. I, I feel like in this industry, especially and play by play specifically, you're only going one of two ways. You're never standing still. And if you ever think like I'm good and not trying to get better or progress, you're falling behind. And, yeah. and the key is, and what I always think about is we're here for the fans and we're here for the listeners. And if we're not doing everything possible, then we're not doing our jobs. Cause I also feel like, especially now baseball, you talk about technology changing and baseball has changed so much too, especially with our understanding of the game. And I feel so lucky that we live in a time where we know so much and we can explain so much more than than we used to and i mm. love that and i feel like we're learning stuff every single day i mean there's a i had a conversation with trent blank recently on the mariner staff and you know part of this conversation was about how the seams like coming off the hand affects you know movement of the ball you know mm -hmm. it, it's it's going to such a different level than where it used to be you know it used to be batting average and rbis and home runs and we've grown so much past that so with that i feel a responsibility a teaching responsibility mm -hmm. and not that i'm the teacher but i'm fortunate that i have access to all these smart people around and i can ask questions and learn and find out and try and explain what's going on with baseball to to our fans and you know people don't have to believe what i say but i feel like uh i, I try to be as informed as possible in telling what people is, is going on and i feel really responsible like that's a big part of our role given because you know your average baseball fan lives a busy life they don't necessarily have time to dive into every little thing but i feel yeah. like it's part of our job to do that Definitely. No, yeah, it's it's fans kind of escape sometimes to get away from their their day to day to be able to lock in and, you know, 
the team that they've been following their entire life to get passionate for a few hours about that. Um, yeah. And it's super cool with, you know, baseball savant and all the statistics that have come out recently. I think it kind of correlates with, you know, when you moved full time with the Mariners, it looks like in 2018 was when you joined the Mariners full time. And I want to say Statcast was 2015 or so yeah. in that, in that range. And I have a quick quote from Kevin Martinez, the executive executive vice president of marketing in 2018, when you were being moved full time, he said, Gary is like a five tool ball player. He can do it all. He's a creative producer, host, play by play announcer, content creator, and has a knack for translating statistics. So the numbers tell a story. We're excited about what Gary will bring to the Mariners baseball as a full time member of our broadcast team. So that's a really cool quote and kind of describes, as you mentioned, your jack of all trades. You got a little piece of everything. So when you move full time with the Mariners, you know, what, what does that move look like? I changed my life. Uh, as I mentioned, I was getting to the point where, yeah, I was grinding for really hard for 10 years. And at this point, family, kids, the whole thing. Did you and have a second job at that time also yes. before that? Yeah. Up until all the way up until I was Mariners full time, I had another full time job outside of all the sports. And I was basically working. I was doing football, basketball, baseball. So I had sports year round, full time job year round. And I was getting to the point where. I can't do this for much longer. Like it yeah. during baseball season to give you an idea of my every day. It was, I would wake up at 5. AM drive to the gym, get a workout in, go to my day job, uh, go to the ballpark, do whatever pre post, come home, do the pod, get to bed at two, 2 AM, something like that. And do it the next day. I mean, there were a lot of days like that. And it, be, it got to the point where it's like, I, I don't know how much longer I can do this. And then it, then it becomes decision times. And I, and that that's been hard along the way too, because I've had some really great opportunities offered in other places and some that I've thought long and hard about, but my heart has always been here. Mm -hmm. And like little kid me has wanted to be the Mariners broadcaster. And so you know, my family's here. My friends are here. Everything's here. And this is where I've always wanted to be. This is where I've wanted to make it happen. So uh, that's always tugged at me. And so it, when I got the job full time, it, it changed everything. And it's it's great that they've allowed me. You know, I took over job title wise for Kevin Kremen, but my job is completely different. There's so many different aspects to it because they have allowed me to kind of branch out and do all these different things. And I'm still trying to do uh, different things. So, mm -hmm. uh, but I, but personally uh, with the family, I, d it's hard to express how much things have changed. Like I remember the first off season and I, I can spend time with the kids and <laughs> our family dinner together. It's just, I, it's, I've tried to make up for some lost time along the way. Cause it, it took a lot of work to get here. So when you first joined the Mariners full time, was that uh, you know radio pre and post kind of like what you're doing before? And what does what what's the day in the life back then look like? And what's mm -hmm. the day in the life today look like? So back then it was producer engineer. So like on every game, doing all the equipment stuff, home and road, and some pre post. Basically, Shannon Dreyer does pre-post mostly and then i step in once in a while uh i, I think i probably did more pre-post back then than i do now uh podcast has stayed the same still doing doing that i think back then it was more daily now it's more three days a week i, could, I feel like uh the difference now is it, it's funny as i've gone on i feel like i've added <laughs> added more to my role and the every day is kind of grown and grown and grown and i've done i do more play-by-play -play now than i did when i started to uh, i've gotten a, a lot of games the last few years which has been great mm -hmm. some of the circumstances of me getting those games haven't been great uh, thanks to the famous basketball game is one example where dave sims tore his achilles and rick <laughs> tore his bicep off his <laughs> off the bone Jeez. so you know, uh, it was great to have me around. It was great to get those games. Not excited about how that happened, but 
uh, you know, the day in the life, I think, has changed just because I have become more efficient at my preparation, which has allowed me more time to dive deeper into uh, the stuff that I really, well, I, I, let me phrase this right. Uh, I love the stories about players and I love finding out things about players that nobody else knows. Right. And that takes a lot of work. And sometimes the work is talking to them. Sometimes it's research. I also like to be, when I go into a game, say the Mariners are playing the Toronto Blue Jays. I like to have the same level of knowledge about the Blue Jays that I do about the Mariners. Now that, that can't exist because I see the Mariners every single day, but I strive for that because I, again, I feel like if you're a Mariners fan tuning in, I assume that you haven't been following the Blue Jays every single day. So I think it's important for me to tell you what's going on with the Blue Jays every day. What's going on with Vlad Guerrero right now? What's happening the last week? You know, all of those things. And I've worked a lot on my preparation, what it takes, my scorebook, uh, <laughs> which, you know, it used to be when I started was just paper and pencil, right? You just scorebook. And now I have uh, an Excel spreadsheet that automatically updates all the numbers every single day. I've got a drop down list. So like when the Mariners play in the Astros, I do the drop down to pick the lineup and then it automatically is into my scorebook and it's on an iPad and I score it and it saves me 30 minutes a day, an hour a day, every single day. So I can go do yeah. something else. So that's the kind of thing I'm always trying to think about is how I can be more efficient at what I do so I can expand in other areas, basically. Yeah. I love those Mariners stat sheets that they give you that are available before the games. And it's on both teams to be able to see all the detailed statistics of, and Alex Mayer does a great job of pulling all of these random stats that you would not be able to find otherwise. So do you spend, you know, some time re reading through both of those pages, both for the, the Mariners and the, and the away team. And, you know, do you, are you circling certain statistics? Like, Hey, I got to talk about that one today, this one today. And then you look for certain stories of different players coming into that series that you can pull out of. So uh, I love stats. I'm a numbers guy, but I make sure I don't want to overwhelm the broadcast with stats. I like to use numbers to tell a story. Mm -hmm. That's what I think is most important. And also uh, what I think about a lot is how we use stats and what stats we want to use, because I'm talking to a really broad audience. Like we are talking from people like you who know everything that we're talking about. If I say WRC plus, you know exactly what I'm talking about. But then there's someone like my dad, who's been a huge baseball fan all his life. He has no idea what WRC plus is. So I'm talking to this, this range of people. So what I like to do and like how I like to express is comparative comparative numbers because i think it has more impact yeah i i feel like too most people don't even know the average batting average is anymore so you say someone's batting 257 i feel like that doesn't have a big impact now i think home runs do you say someone has 40 home runs i think automatically most people understand what that is so i like to use comparative stats whether i'm talking about wrc plus or if i'm talking batting average uh, I like to say a guy has the fifth best WRC plus in the American league. Yeah. That way I don't have to go into a detailed description of what WRC plus is. I can give you something a little more vague on it, but you understand it's the fifth best. And if I say, Oh, the top three are Otani, you know, try, you know, you go down the list, some of the great players, like you get an automatic understanding of, wow. That's significant, even if you have no idea what WRC plus means. So that's how I like to use numbers. And I like to use numbers to tell the story. Uh, so I like to dig deeper. The, the game notes are great that they, they give us. And I always peruse just to make sure I don't miss anything. But the fun for me is 
diving in. I love doing my own research. I love finding, you know, these, these little nuggets that I think are really cool because mm -hmm. I, I feel like if I think it's cool and interesting that other people will think it's cool and interesting. So that's, that's kind of how I'm just, I'm trying to be really aware, but I'm also really curious. I'm like, why is that? You know, why is that? And half the things I look up don't end up anywhere. It's like, it, it's a, it's a nothing. It's a waste of time, but then there's pots of gold at the end of the rainbow sometimes. So, so you just throw on different filters, like, Hey, you know, yeah. this, 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 and this, and Oh, there's a Mariner player right there. We could use that. Yeah. I, you know, I find it's, I find curiosity is the best thing to have as a broadcaster, or anything in my role, because it leads you to thinking about things in a different way or trying to, or wondering about something or finding something out. And sometimes you stumble into something completely unexpected, but that's it. It's just filtering and looking things up and wondering why something's happening. And, and it's asking questions. And again, the thing that I'm so thankful for is the Mariners are great about access to their organization and I can talk to anyone at any time and ask any questions that a whole lot of people that are smarter than I am about what's going on. And I feel pretty fortunate in that way. Yeah, that's awesome. I love it. Love it. Yeah. And my, I myself am, am a big stack guy with the analytics and that's why I love something like OPS plus because yeah. it compares, you know, their ability to get on base and production compared to the average hitter in one number. So 130 is they're 30% better than the average hitter. So yeah. I think that's what's important too for us trying to educate people and and tell people what's going on and why decisions are made. I mean that that's the other thing that I'm I'm trying to get across is telling people what's going on, why decisions are made. You know, I think it's just really important on a roll. And there there's so much, there's so much information and just trying to, to pare it all down so people can understand it. Which broadcast that you've been a part of stands out to you the most? Oh, oh, there's so many. Uh, there's two that I think of right away. There's one. It was it was one of my first play by play games, and the St. Louis Cardinals were in town, and it was cool because it was throwback. So the Cardinals were in their sweet baby blues, and the Mariners were wearing throwback jerseys, and I was on play by play for that game. My dad is from St. Louis. So I grew up going to Mariners games, loving the Mariners. But I also grew up loving the 80s Cardinals, too, because my dad loved the Cardinals. You know, Willie McGee's and Vince Coleman and Tom Herr and Jack Clark and those teams just ran around and didn't hit homers and stole bases. But Ozzie Smith, they were super fun. And so I was on play by play calling this game with the Cardinals wearing their eighties uniforms and the Mariners wearing their eighties uniforms. And it was just one of those, like, I can't believe this is happening moments. You, you, you work so hard at something, you put everything into it, not knowing if it's ever going to pay off. Like all of this could have, all this work could have just ended up with nothing. And even at that point, I didn't know, what was going to happen. Cause I think this was even before I was full time, but in that moment, I'm like, this is incredible. This is amazing. And no matter what happens from here, uh, I will always have this game and this memory of my childhood coming to life in front of me, which was great. And the other one that I'll never forget was on the call for the James Paxton, no hitter in Toronto. Oh man. Yeah. Cause it's again, one of those things it's, it's like, I'm doing play by play on these games. This is so fun. I love it. And then, wow, this like history is unfolding right <laughs> in front of me. And I'm on, I'm on the call and it's in Toronto too, which made it super cool because James Paxton's back home and the whole thing. I just, I still can't believe I was a part of, and it's, it's just one of those pinch me moments again. I mean, there's so many games like that. I mean, obviously the playoff games too, but just from a personal games I think about those are the two that really stick out yeah and being able to have the the presence to be in the moment and to realize you know where you are what you're doing the setting that you're in and just being able to take it in and, and appreciate that moment in time I think is really important because like you mentioned it's like you're working so hard for something you have tunnel vision it's like all you're doing is working towards the next thing mm -hmm. and then 
you're at where you wanted to be and it's like oh my gosh you know this is happening yeah i know that's a good point because i struggle with that too because i've always been so focused and just working 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 and i still struggle because i i'd like to do more games i'd like to call all the games you know at some point too so i'm still you know i'm not settled i'm still working ahead so it, it is finding that balance right of being mindful of where you are and enjoying where you're at and still looking forward and working at it. Right. And, and yeah, it's like also the same thing with, with players as with us, it's like, you're working so hard. And, you know, when you ask a player, if they've like Bryce Miller, he had a stellar rookie season. It's like, have you taken a moment to just think back on your rookie season? It's like, I'm sure he hasn't because he's, he's learning a splitter. He's learning on how he can get better this next season. And then that's where it's like, you know, before you know it, your career is over and then all you have is to look back. So, yeah. but yeah. So taking those times to realize how far you've come, where mm -hmm. you're at and where you're heading is pretty cool. And then also with that, uh, James Paxson, no hitter, he was on my fantasy team. So I was actually li listening to that broadcast live on radio as I was driving somewhere. And I, I heard the final outs of you on the radio. So that's amazing. <laughs> oh, it's so great. It was now, fun too. Yeah. Like it was in Toronto too. Fans got behind him at the end. It felt like uh, felt like Rocky in Russia. It was great. Big Maple, <laughs> love it. <laughs> so now getting into some current day, you know, this off season. I'm just curious on your initial thoughts of this off season as a whole. You know, it's really been a tale of two halves. The initial teardown after the whole Root Sports information came out soon after the season ended. I'm curious yourself. You know, do you do you allow yourself to be a little emotional at first, or is it kind of you just have to stay as level minded as possible and realize that you know there's more coming, this isn't final, or do you let some of those big trades be like, wow, what what is going on right now? No, we get emotional too. I mean, yeah. we're you know we're right there with fans in that way. I mean, there's no there's there's no difference at times between what we feel, what fans feel. I mean, I, I feel, I feel close to fans. I grew up a Mariners fan. I, I grew up here. I'm in contact with Mariner fans. Every, all my friends, family, you know, texts, uh, yeah. running to people, the store, like it, you know, it's, it's my life. So I, I feel like I, I always feel a bond to Mariners fans. Uh, you know, it's funny. I feel like this conversation is so different than it was two months ago, right? For the obvious reasons that you just <laughs> right. pointed out. And I am really impressed with what Jerry and Justin did this off season and given the circumstances that you mentioned, because, you know, at the end of last year, they're so close. They're, they're right on the doorstep of the playoffs. And I've been one that always says, you just got to get in. And if you can get in, anything can happen. And last year was a perfect example of that. I mean, no one had the Rangers and Diamondbacks in the World Series, right? So you just yeah. got to get in. Now, could the Mariners have run it back and maybe things fall differently and gotten in this year? Yeah, maybe. But I felt like at the end of last year, they needed to get better. They needed to improve. And given the circumstances at the beginning of the offseason, it wasn't clear to me how they were going to do enough to make that happen. I thought it was going to be really hard. And at the end of the day, and especially the last two moves for me, I thought really put it over the top. I thought yeah. Polanco offensively was a huge key for them. And uh, Santos, bullpen-wise, I think huge. I think those two, coupled with everything they did before, Garver and Rayleigh and everything else, but those two specifically – really turn the tide on this off season. And I think they are a better team than they were last year. And, you know, it's funny with all the frustration because it's e easy to forget, I think, but they are in such a good spot with their pitching. It's just dominant when you look at the rotation and when you look at the back end of the bullpen, I think you can make a case. They have the best three starters in baseball and the best trio of relievers in baseball. I mean, the other teams would make an argument too. So it's, you know, it's an argument, but you can make a case for that. And that's a great starting point for any team. So yeah. uh, I'm excited about this season. I'm optimistic. Absolutely. I actually just posted a video yesterday showing the, the statistics of why the Mariners are going to have the most valuable bullpen in baseball. And cause it's Munoz, it's Brash, it's Santos. Mm -hmm. 
but then it's you go further back and there's guys like Carlos Vargas that they got this offseason. You know, you didn't expect, you know, getting relievers back in trades for key pieces in your lineup isn't necessarily what you'd expect. Right. But also Jackson Coar, like these guys that they have the tools. It's just like what I mentioned in the video is Pete Woodworth just needs to show them the statistics of getting ahead 01 instead of falling behind 10, dominate the zone, throw your nasty stuff in the zone because you're gonna get guys out. So and yeah, potentially the biggest win is that they didn't have to trade some of their young controllable starting pitchers. And they were able to offload Robbie while he was injured with his contract that frees up money. If we'll have to see if they spend it, but now you have the, the same starting rotation that is going to be a top three rotation in baseball year in and year out. Yeah. I'm excited to see what Miller and Wu do coming into this year. And we, we've talked to both of them so far this off season. I'm really excited because it's clear when you look at the splits for both of them, they both had trouble with lefties, especially uh, Wu even more heavy than, than Miller. But it's amazing. You look at the overall numbers and they were really good. So you think if you can just cut into that a little, I mean, what could their seasons look like? And then of course you add that to the, the three at the top of the rotation and you're in a great spot and you make such a great point about the bullpen and you know, talking to uh, Greg Spire about it or Gabe Spire about it. It's so interesting to hear because he is all in. I mean, Gabe was talking about because he took the OO to a whole new level. Uh, Aaron talked about it that he, as far as throughout the shortened year in 2020, like since they've tracked it, Gabe Spire has the highest first pitch strike rate for any reliever ever. Like he is taking really? this whole different level. Yeah. And you look at what he did in Kansas city, just surface number wise and what he did last year for the Mariners. It is amazing. And a lot of it is on the backs of that, just getting ahead. Now it's not as simple as just throwing the ball down the middle, but he's making quality pitches on on OO and he's getting ahead all the time. First pitch strikes all the time. And, you know, I've talked about the big three a lot this off season and you know, a lot of people inside the Mariners feel like it's a top four because they feel like Spire is a dude as well and really mm. unique from the left side. And, you know, like his ERA doesn't didn't jump off the page last year, but a couple of those were just, you know, like nine runs in two different games. You know how it works with relievers. Like I can throw off an ERA for two months, but he's also a guy, you know, he's facing, he's the one that's been facing Otani. He's the one facing Alvarez. He's the one facing yeah. all the top lefties. So I think it's it's a good case to be made that when we talk about the back end, like Spire's probably in there too. And then I'm sure. excited, just like you. I'm I'm excited to see like who else are they gonna unearth because they always seem to find the next guy that's gonna be part of it, which is super fun. It makes it tricky in a year like this because I have to prep on 30 different relievers. <laughs> and maybe one of them is the next Paul Sewell. I don't know, but I'll be ready for one of them to step forward just in case. Yeah. <laughs> it was and my, it was the biggest lesson I learned from the Paul Sewell spring training is I can't treat any of these guys like they're just roster filler, right. From, from a, just a broadcast perspective, because they could all be the next, whatever the next. Absolutely. Yeah. The next guy to help out in the pen. Yeah, you talk about Spire and a part of that video, I uncovered some of the stats and that's why I think baseball savant is so amazing, you know, showing chase percentage, walk percentage, hard hit percentage, all these different things. And Gabe Spire, okay, no one in baseball made hitters chase more out of the zone last year than Gabe Spire. He was the top guy for that. And part of that has to be because he was dominating the zone. Mm -hmm. So when he does throw it out of the zone, they figure it's going to be in the zone. They chase out of the zone. Um, he was also the only player in baseball last year to be in the 90th percentile or higher in chase percentage, walk percentage, and ground ball percentage. So wow. it's just certain things that, and, it, and as I mentioned in the video also, it's like the average baseball fan does not know who Gabe Spire is, mm -hmm. but he was one of the best relief pitchers in all of baseball. Um, yeah. Yeah, you mentioned that too with uh, first pitch strike percentage because – we asked him too, like his percentage is so high on first pitch strikes. Did he feel like teams were adjusting? And he said, as the season got 
went along, like he was getting first pitch strikes on breaking balls in the dirt just because, you know, teams were expecting him to first pitch strike. Here it comes. Oh, it's out of the zone. But so he was adjusting, but still getting that first pitch strike, which is pretty great. I love stuff like that. I love, I love the cat and mouse of pitcher versus hitter and, you know, the thought process behind what's going on. I love that stuff. So. Yeah. And yeah, I heard him talking on your podcast and then also heard, you know, Bryce Miller, this isn't, I don't know if this has been really reported on, you know, he's been learning the splitter, but he's mm -hmm. also been learning or dialing in a new slurve, which is more of a, a pitch that will be able to play against lefties versus his sweeper that didn't play against lefties last year. Um, yeah. So I guess that kind of moves into you were down in Arizona this, this weekend, you're going to be back down there. What are some initial sights, sounds, you know, uh, insights that you have on what spring training, some, some things that players are working on. Yeah, the it that's always the most fun I think about spring training is trying to figure out, especially from the pitching side, especially from this current group, because they are not afraid to try new things pitching wise and new pitches and whatnot. So I'm always anxious to see, okay, who's got what? And sometimes it doesn't, you know, it doesn't pan out during the regular season, but sometimes it can end up being a game changer. So, you know. Go, this is going to be such an interesting spring training because there's not a lot of roster competition. Uh, competition. We kind of know what mm -hmm. the 26 man is going to be. Essentially, you know, there's a battle for maybe the last bullpen spot, maybe the last position player. But this spring to me is like, okay, get your work in, stay healthy. And yeah, that other stuff is what I'll be looking at. Like, what does Miller splitter look like? I'm really anxious to see what that looks like. I'm anxious to see what Wu looks like. He was, he was, when we talked to him, he wasn't as specific. Uh, he didn't, he's not, he's not adding a pitch, but I'm curious to see if any of them look differently, like how he'll attack lefty specifically, what that looks like. So it's little things like that in spring training. Uh, and of course, for me, the most fun that I have is because I, I end up during the course of the year talking to the young players from the system, you know, Harry Ford's of the world and Cole Emerson and Cole Young, all those guys in the system. Mm -hmm. And you know, I read the box score, I see the videos, but I never, for obvious reasons, I never get to see him play. So spring training's like the time that I can actually see them on the field, like see them for the first time playing, which is pretty fun. So in some respects, because I'm realistic about spring training, like, records don't matter like when we're calling a game in mid-march between the mariners and rangers the mariners win or lose that has no bearing on the regular season i'm not a spring training stats guy like julio could go three for 50 in spring or 40 for 50 and it wouldn't influence what i thought about julio the minute he steps into the batter's box in the regular season at all yeah so it's kind of the it's the little nuances that I look for in spring. Velo too, like mm -hmm. man, he's throwing three miles per hour harder. Bobby or Ray was up to ninety-seven last spring. That's right. Or on the other side of it, like man, he's throwing four miles per hour off. Which yeah. sometimes early in spring, that's that's not necessarily a thing, but it's something to watch. So it, it's funny, and from from our broadcast perspective, I think spring games are the most challenging things we do because you're calling a game that doesn't matter, you know, in wins and losses. So you've got to find the other things that do matter and do matter for the course of the regular season. And that's some of the things that you're talking about. And then a lot of those starters, you know, are in for four to six what? innings. And then there's all these guys that you have to pull out the stat sheet and uh -huh. flip through pages to find who they are. Um, and then I've always been, locked in on Ryan Davish's tweets throughout spring training because he videos a lot of the live at bats, a lot of the bullpens. My one ask would be if you could convince the Mariners to get a little GoPro and just set it next to Cal while he's catching bullpens. Cause all of those, you know, angles of seeing the pitches come in is just amazing. So I, one of the things I love about spring is the bullpens because it's right there. I mean, there's, you just don't get an opportunity in real life to stand essentially five feet from Matt Brash when he throws a bullpen. Yeah. And, and there's, 
space some so sometimes i go and walk behind and watch this thing and honestly i have no idea how anyone gets a hit in major league baseball yeah. i find it ridiculous and these are just bullpens but i watch brash throw a bullpen watch muñoz throw a bullpen castillo it is utterly ridiculous <laughs> i have so much respect for hitters because yeah. i think hitting has never been this hard ever and i watch the wicked stuff every night that gets better and better and better man you look at the mariners just the stuff on their staff it's absurd man and 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 seeing it up close like that like i think we appreciate it on tv and when you're at the ballpark, you certainly appreciate it. And you see the radar gun and that's amazing. But when you walk up and get close to where a batter would stand, I don't get it. I don't get how anyone hits. I just don't, I don't at all because the way it's not only the velocity, it's the movement, just killer movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, it's a great suggestion. I'll see what I can do about it. Cause and it's what, fun. The angle's amazing. And one thing that I noticed from a, a video that Ryan posted yesterday of Logan Gilbert's bullpen is that he signaled for a cutter and also for a sinker. So mm -hmm. I know that he hasn't thrown, he threw like eight sinkers last year that registered as a sinker or something like that. He hasn't thrown a cutter yet. So I'm curious if he's adding in a four seam, a sinker and a cutter. Yeah. You know, I'm anxious to talk to Logan yet. I haven't uh, about this off season. What strikes me about this off season is, uh, you know, he has basically gone through an entire oval overhaul the last two off seasons, like yeah. big, massive changes. And so this one feels like more of adjusting. So I'm curious if he has made an addition. I'm, I'm really impressed with a, a guy like Logan, kind of what you were talking about earlier, who came up, you know, fastball heavy. And I think that arsenal would have worked and he could have been a successful major league player, but, it wouldn't have got him to where he is now. And it's funny because I don't think the, the surface numbers reflect it, but I think he's a much better pitcher than he was just a year ago. And I'm, I'm really optimistic about the year that Logan Gilbert's going to have. And I think it's because of all the work on the secondaries that he's put in. So I am curious to see what else he's pulled off from his bag of tricks this season. Yeah, and I think I saw that the stat was that his splitter was his best out pitch last year. He had the most strikeouts with a splitter of any pitch. So if, yeah, if he dials in another, and like, you know, talking with Pete Woodworth, it's like Bryce Miller, one pitch will get you to the big leagues, but then it's a matter of how you stay in the big leagues. And that's where you have to add all these different pitches and throwing the two seam, you're throwing it just like the four seam. It's just, you know, figuring out how to locate it. Um, yeah, I know you have another interview coming up. Really appreciate your time today. Great conversation. Looking forward to connecting throughout the season as we follow the, the team. And uh, yeah, really appreciate your time. Yeah, anytime, Connor. We'll definitely get together during the season. This is fun. Out to center. This is great. It's way back. It is gone.